Hello and welcome to our special coverage of the Russian invasion of Ukraine. I am Ladi Akri Dunwale, the headlines. Ukraine regroups defenses after losing Lohansk as Russia prepares new Donbass push. UK Prime Minister Boris Johnson suggests finding alternative routes to move grain out of Ukraine. And Swedish Prime Minister Magdalena Andersson meets its Ukrainian leader Vladimir Zelensky in Kiev as both parties sign a joint statement on defense and energy cooperation. We begin the program today with news that Russian missiles have struck the Black Sea port city of Mykolaiv earlier this morning as air raid sirens were activated across the city. The mayor, Alexander Senkovich, said this morning the occupiers fired rockets in Mykolaiv, rescuers, medics, emergency crews and utility workers are already working on the ground. Missiles have struck Mykolaiv several times over the last few days. On June the 30th, authorities said a strike on a residential building killed six people and wounded at least another six. Meanwhile, Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky has said that his country's armed forces continue to resist Russian attacks to ensure Ukraine remained independent. Speaking during his nightly video address, Mr. Zelensky said towns retaken by Ukrainian forces required colossal funds for reconstruction. He said there had been little change on the battlefield yesterday. Russia captured the city of Luhansk in Lysyshanks on July the 3rd, bringing an end to one of the biggest battles in Europe. Ukrainian forces have liberated more than a thousand occupiers, and new ones are added every week. Now, for example, in the south of our country, all of them suffered significant destruction, and this also implies the need for colossal funds for the restoration of infrastructure for the return of medicine and social services, for the restoration of normal economic life. There are tens of thousands of destroyed houses alone in the liberated areas. There have been no significant changes on the battlefield during the day. The enemy continues to terrorize the border districts of the Sumy region, the city of Kharkiv, and the districts of the region. Donbass. The armed forces of Ukraine respond, push and destroy the offensive potential of the occupiers day after day. We need to break them. It is a difficult task. It requires time and superhuman efforts, but we have no alternative. It is about our independence, about our future, about the fate of the entire Ukrainian people. And Moscow's capture of the Luhansk region is the last victory for Russia on Ukrainian territory. And that's according to an advisor of the head of Ukraine's president's office. Alexei Arestovich said in an online post that besides the battle for Donetsk, Ukraine was hoping to launch counteroffensives in the south of the country. He said taking the cities in the east meant that 60% of Russian forces are now concentrated there and it is difficult for them to redirect to the south. And dozens of mainly elderly people in the eastern Ukrainian city of Kramatorsk queued up for hours yesterday to receive milk, bread, and other groceries from the world central kitchen. Many are fearful Russian forces will try to seize all of the Donetsk region after capturing Luhansk last week. Bakhmut, Slovyansk, and nearby Kramatorsk lie southwest of Lysyshansk and are the main urban areas holding out against Russian forces in Donetsk. More than two-thirds of the city's population has left since the war began, leaving just over 60,000 people. But many said they did not have any choice rather than stay, as they could not afford to rent apartments and support their families away from their homes. In another development, British Prime Minister Boris Johnson says alternative routes to retrieve grain stock in Ukraine will need to be looked at if the Bosphorus Strait cannot be used to remove it. 
Earlier, Turkey said that it had halted a Russian-flagged cargo ship off its Black Sea coast and is investigating a Ukrainian crane, uh, claim that it was carrying stolen grain. Mr. Johnson went on to say that OPEC Plus must produce more oil to try to tackle a growing cost of living crisis and bring down prices. Swedish Prime Minister Magdalena Andersson has met Ukraine's President Vladimir Zelensky in Kiev with the two parties signing a joint statement on defense and energy cooperation. The Swedish Prime Minister added that the country would be supportive of NATO's open-door policy, which is based on Article 10 of its founding treaty, which states that any decision to invite a country to join the alliance must be based on consensus amongst all allies. President Zelensky said it was the first such document in the history of bilateral relations. The joint statement sets out key issues for both states. This applies in particular to defense cooperation, sectoral cooperation in the fields of nuclear energy, energy efficiency, and financial support. Mr. Zelensky thanked Sweden for its humanitarian support for Ukraine. And Ursula von der Leyen, the president of the European Commission, says it will set up a reconstruction platform to coordinate the rebuilding of Ukraine after its war with Russia. She told the Ukraine Recovery Conference in the Swiss city of Lugano that a platform will be used to map investment needs, coordinate action and channel resources. The platform will bring together countries, institutions, the private sector and civil society. It will also include international organizations like the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development, as well as the European Investment Bank. Ukraine's Prime Minister, Denis Shimihal, has said that Ukraine needs $750 billion for a three-stage recovery plan in the wake of Russia's invasion. Mr. Shimihal said that there had been over $100 billion of direct damage to Ukrainian infrastructure from Russia's invasion. He says uh, Ukraine's recovery plan, which is supposed to have three phases, a uh, first focus on fixing things that matter for people's daily lives, like water supply, which is ongoing, a fast recovery component that will be launched as soon as fighting ends, including temporary housing, hospital and school projects, and one that aims to transform the country over the longer term. Mm -hmm. British Foreign Minister Liz Truss says Russia must pay for the damage it has inflicted on Ukraine during its appalling war, while Kiev also needs help to revive its battered economy. Ms. Truss made the comments on the sidelines of the Ukraine Recovery Conference in Lugano, Switzerland, adding that Britain is looking at legislation to seize assets from people responsible for the war. Ah. Ukrainian forces in the Zaporizhia region have started using the U.S. high-mobility artillery rocket system HIMARS in their combat operations against Russia. This was announced by the general staff of the armed forces of Ukraine on social media while posting videos of the operation. Ukraine's defense minister said his country received the HIMARS from the United States last month. Citing military sources across the country, Ukrainian national news agencies, Ukreform, said that Russia continued to bombard Chernikov, Sumy, and Kherson regions. Its uh, presidential advisor, Oleksiy Arestovich, on Monday described a successful Ukraine's military operation in the key city of Luhansk. Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov is expected to fly to Hanoi today for a two-day visit to Vietnam before heading to a G20 meeting later this week in Indonesia. The Vietnamese government says the visit is at the invitation of its foreign minister, Bo Tai Son, but it comes as the two nations mark the 10th anniversary of what is described as their comprehensive strategic agreement. Russia is Vietnam's biggest arms supplier and its companies are involved in several major energy projects in the country. The two nations have closed ties dating back to the Soviet era and Vietnam has not so far condemned Russia's invasion of Ukraine which Moscow calls a special operation. In April, Vietnam voted against a resolution to suspend Russia from the UN Human Rights Council over the war.
Meanwhile, Mr. Sergei Lavrov says the harassment of Russian journalists in the U.S., Europe and Ukraine has reached a massive scale. The minister told reporters during a joint press conference with Venezuela's top diplomat that Moscow never wanted to take any measures that would affect journalistic freedoms. But Washington and its allies leave Russia with no choice but to reciprocate. According to him, Russia is interested in ending the war on journalists, adding that the Western nations apparently cannot stop it without losing face. He argues that Moscow cannot just stand idly by given the pressure its journalists are facing, especially since the persecution has reached a scale that is impossible to bear any longer. Let's speak now to Vladimir Dubovic, Associate Professor at the Department of International Relations, Meknikov National University in Odessa, that's in Ukraine. He joins us uh, virtually from Lviv. Good morning to you, Prof. Uh, thank you for your time this morning. Good morning to you, sir. Good morning. Let's, uh, let's start off uh, from the situation where you are. What's it like uh, on the ground uh, there in Lviv? We know that in the earlier stages of the war, uh, Lviv was one of the cities uh, that were quite in the center of it. But what's the situation like now? It's uh, relatively quiet uh, comparing to many other parts of Ukraine. Uh, for instance, my hometown, Odessa, uh, is a more nervous situation. We had some missile strikes, including one three days ago where a uh, number of people got uh, killed and wounded in a high story, uh, nine story apartment building, and also two summer camps nearby were hit by Russian missiles. Uh, even worse, of course, is in Donbass, in the eastern part of Ukraine, where the uh, heavy fighting is taking place, and many cities and towns are basically raised to the ground. Well, we probably heard about Mariupol in the previous months, which is basically non existent right now as a city, and only about 100,000 people staying there. Uh, out of uh, 500,000 before the war. So uh, comparatively speaking, uh, this Western Ukraine uh, is not that uh, uh, diff difficult situation because we have uh, we are far away from those uh, uh, Russian troops. Missiles can fly here, obviously Russian missiles, and they do. Uh, they primarily so far been hitting, uh, uh, with few exceptions, been hitting uh, infrastructure, uh, oil reservoirs, uh, electric uh, power uh, facilities, and things like that. So they're trying to uh, disrupt the Russians are trying to disrupt the flow of uh, weapons into Ukraine and other goods into Ukraine, and also to endanger the entire uh, possibility for Ukrainians to travel back and forth uh, between the country on one hand and uh, immediate uh, Western neighbors like Poland, uh, uh, Hungary, and Slovakia on the other hand. What, 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 what's it like um, on the ground in terms of access to medical supplies, groceries, uh, things like that? Uh, are, you, are you able to uh, retain, I know, I mean, you're speaking to me virtually, so that means that the, tele, uh, uh, the telecommunications at least is working, uh, but is it stable or does it, you know, I mean, does it fluctuate? What's everyday li uh, li uh, life like? Do you have access uh, to information? I mean, you're an academic, so I mean, you thrive on information. Do you have access to this? Uh, and uh, how has it been with uh, family members? Uh, because at base, that is the most important thing before you now talk about what is happening in the country itself. Sure, absolutely. Great question. Thank you, sir. I think uh, that uh, why I'm, I'm fine, actually, and most people around me here in this region, we're fine. We have this uh, access to information. <laughs> Internet is working, uh, electricity, power supply, water supply, what have you. Everything's fine, and uh, we haven't been affected too much by the war. Uh, but uh, we are starting to feel the effect uh, uh, because uh, the economy is being destroyed with uh, heavy Russian bombing and shelling. Uh, it costs us a lot. And our budget, national budget, is empty right now. So we are heavily relying now on international financial assistance. Uh, I, for instance, already had a little delays with me, my payment, my salary being paid to me. Uh, nothing major so far, but it could get worse as the war drags on. Uh, the, the food is available too where I am and in most places in Ukraine. And actually, surprisingly, uh, Ukraine is a resilient country and uh, it's not a failed state. Even with this massive invasion ongoing, uh, we have a government which is functioning. We have a president who hasn't left. He's been suggested several times to leave Kiev for, for his uh, safety. He said, no, no, I'm staying where I am, in the capital of the country. So there is a, still a major consolidation of the Ukrainian people and being resilient uh, in this uh, attempt to withstand and fight back uh, the Russian invasion. Uh, in some places where there is a heavy bombing uh, and shelling, of course, in the east of the country, in some places in the south, like, for instance, the city of Mykolaiv, which is just about 100 miles, even less, from my hometown of Odessa, 
uh, there is a more of evacuations and more troubles with uh, internet and water and electricity and food and medicine. You know, the medicine is a huge issue in those uh, areas like uh, occupied areas like Mariupol I mentioned already, some other places. People are not getting enough insulin, for instance, and many other medicines. Uh, so it's becoming a huge problem also in the, in the, in the south, the Kherson region, uh, which Russians quickly occupied, but uh, now the, our forces, armed forces are trying to uh, counter offense uh, the, to do counter offensive there. Uh, they also lack uh, some very basic uh, supplies. Uh, let's talk uh, a bit more broadly about the conflict itself. Now, naturally, I mean, being Ukrainian, uh, um, you feel this personally, and there is the question uh, of what is it possible to do uh, for peace, uh, because all attempts, all previous attempts have uh, failed uh, to achieve any kind of uh, peace uh, since this started uh, on the 24th of February. But do you think that uh, there is any chance that this matter could be resolved other than on the battlefield? And I ask that question based on what is happening on the ground. There are so many people who are prepared to support Ukraine, but the fighting is taking place in Ukraine. It's not taking place in any of those places. As you've already identified, a lot of destruction, uh, particularly of infrastructure, uh, is taking place, not to talk about the human toll. But as an academic, uh, maybe I, I, I can ask you to, for a moment, separate yourself from the Ukrainian uh, uh, in you and look at this matter somewhat dispassionately. How do, what do you think could be done, particularly by those who are in a position to influence both sides, to bring both to the table and stop all this carnage? Right, and that's a great question. Thank you, sir. Uh, and actually, let me say that I'm very grateful to you and uh, people in Nigeria who are listening to our conversation, uh, it's uh, really very important to us, valuable for us, uh, that people around the world, uh, despite their own problems on the ground, they're still paying attention to what's happening to my country and this war of Russia and Ukraine. So thank you. Uh, in answering your question, let me say that, of course, the war is a terrible thing on Ukraine. It's uh, going to bring down our economy. We're going to be uh, really under receiving the, the in incomes uh, or you know the earnings from the economy. There are big uh, plants that are shattered. Uh, most of our industrial base is actually in the east of Ukraine, the southeast of Ukraine, where the war is happening, and some of the biggest of them have been destroyed uh, beyond uh, repair. Uh, so the people who are leaving Ukraine, as you know, there are refugees, uh, they say about five to six million people outside of Ukraine. And then also there are people like myself, internally displaced persons, IDPs, uh, who are even uh, bigger in number, maybe something like eight uh, million or something. So altogether, refugees plus IDPs, it's one third of Ukraine's population. And uh, people had to leave uh, quickly because in the early days of invasion, uh, Russian troops were advancing quite uh, quite quickly. So people left really quickly with all they had, you know, a couple of bags and things like that. Uh, now already there have been numbers I've been seeing yesterday that about one million people uh, of Ukrainians uh, don't have housing anymore because of shelling, uh, because their buildings are, uh, you know, being destroyed. Uh, you know, most of the Ukrainians actually live in big apartment buildings. So if you have a missile hitting one of those, basically an entire building is out of shape. You can't. You can't return to leave there. So it's a heavy, heavy toll, and we're well aware of that. Um, there are funerals every day in each and every town of Ukraine. We're seeing soldiers being brought back from the front line in coffins. And uh, we therefore want peace. But the peace uh, shouldn't be achieved by any means. That's an opinion of not just of our government, but of the people. We had a sociological poll the other day, I think about two, three or four days ago. And 80-plus uh, percent of Ukrainians Think, say that they want peace, but not at the cost of conceding some lands of Ukrainian lands to Russia. Uh, and also, people understand that if we sign this uh, uh, unfavorable deal to us, to Ukraine, it would be only embolden uh, Russian aggression in the future. You know, they would want uh, more uh, lands. They would see that by force, uh, they can actually conquer more of Ukraine. The idea of independent sovereign Ukraine uh, outside of Russian sphere of influence, that's, that's what really bothering people in Kremlin, in Moscow. Uh, and uh, if any part of Ukraine will sustain, you know, and even get stronger or maybe even get closer to the West uh, or some Western uh, institutions or uh, alliances, uh, that is unacceptable to the current political elite in Moscow. So therefore, we actually need to live through these very difficult times and not to let them in a strong negotiation position in the end when they would be able to dictate us the conditions of peace. That's, that's how it is. And also because of the war crimes we have discovered here in Ukraine, 
in some towns that were under their control and then <clears throat> were liberated by Ukrainian forces, uh, hundreds and thousands of people have been just killed summarily. And that's really created a certain atmosphere in, in a society, a certain mood, there's a certain attitude where it was with people who are saying, yes, it's a tough war, but we cannot let them prevail because uh, there will be, it would be fair and it would be safe for us in the future because if they prevail this time again, uh, in the future, they will come again with more invasions and we don't want to see that. Uh, let's take a look at the neighbors here. Um, the neighbors can broadly be divided into two groups. There are those uh, who are already uh, pro-West. They're already firmly in the Western alliance, the likes of Poland uh, uh, and, uh, and others. And then there were those who were sort of neutral. Uh, so you had Sweden, you had uh, Finland and uh, uh, Norway and so on, who were neutral countries, uh, so to speak. And then you had those who were pro-Western, but quite friendly with Moscow, the likes of Hungary as well, uh, who, were, who are in uh, the EU. Um, so, at these three groups, how have they, do you think, related to the conflict uh, in Ukraine? I know that you referenced the fact that Poland has borne quite a bit of the brunt because a lot of people who had to leave Ukraine uh, uh, at the start of the war, went for the nearest borders, and the nearest borders were into Poland, and Poland welcomed them with open arms. Uh, by the last count, uh, about 4 million, or just under 4 million, uh, went to Poland. Whether they stayed in Poland, of course, is an entirely different matter, uh, but they went there initially. So what, what has been uh, the reaction in that re regard? from what you know and from what you're told by those that you have spoken with. Right. I'll try to be concise because I can easily do a lecture for an hour, hour and a half on this. But uh, well, the only one thing Norway is in NATO uh, and Finland and Sweden will be joining soon. And therefore, the entire Scandinavian region plus Finland uh, will be within NATO soon. And uh, uh, I'd like to say that, yes, so we are getting some assistance from all of those countries you mentioned and many others. So. Uh, let's not get it wrong in the sense that some countries wish us to lose this war or something. Uh, that's not true. Some countries are joining uh, by sending financial assistance, others sending weapons. For instance, there is the con International Contact Group on Ukraine's Defense, uh, which uh, started in a, at, the, at the meeting at the uh, U.S. base in Germany called Rammstein. So a lot of people call it the Rammstein process. Uh, there's 40 plus countries there who are somehow interested in helping Ukraine. And it's not just European countries or, say, Canada and U.S. It also has countries in, uh, in the Pacific, uh, like South Korea, like Japan, like Australia, New Zealand. So it's a quite a broad coalition of countries that are helping Ukraine uh, during these difficult times. Uh, other countries just would probably just host uh, refugees. Uh, Hungary, for instance, yes, uh, specific policy, very peculiar one, by Mr. Orban, their prime minister, who has a big uh, beef and a trouble and a history of troubles with European Union's uh, commission, uh, you know, trying to push him to do certain things. He doesn't want to do that that way. And, uh, you know, he, he tries to do it in his certain way. And he likes uh, Mr. Putin and cherishes uh, direct connection to Mr. Putin. So, but in other sense, in other uh, senses, uh, Hungary is also helping us. Uh, they haven't blocked mm -hmm. the sanctions so far against Russia. And they haven't, uh, and they haven't actually uh, refused to uh, take our refugees. And actually, percentage-wise, if you compare the population of the country and how many refugees are coming in, uh, Hungary is having quite a high percentage of Ukrainian uh, refugees. It's a small country, so of course it's not too many people. But uh, yes, uh, I mean, there could be some divisions in this coalition uh, over time because the war is becoming more protracted. It's dragging on, uh, you know, and the people are beginning uh, in the West, uh, in the countries uh, that are allied with us in many ways or supportive of Ukraine. Uh, people are beginning to, to question and, uh, uh, as like, how long can we do that? because we already have inflation, we already have higher gas prices, we already have some uh, effect of the sanctions on Russia, but the effect on the economies of the countries that introduce the sanctions. So is Ukraine that important that we're spending so many, uh, so many, so much money to help them? And uh, so there will be such voices, obviously, and of, of course, in Moscow is hoping and counting on uh, the people in the West uh, losing their patience, uh, the coalition of pro-Ukrainian countries unraveling, uh, and uh, in the end, uh, Ukraine uh, staying one uh, eye to eye, so to speak, uh, with, with Russia. But that wouldn't happen. There'll be some countries, maybe not the entire European Union, but many countries in the European Union, 
that would continue to support Ukraine. And President Biden, frankly, said another day as well that the U.S. will support Ukraine as long as it takes for us not to lose this war. It's a different emphasis. If you would talk to American administration the months a half ago, for instance, they were saying Ukraine is winning and Russia is going to be defeated. They're not saying such thing anymore, uh, but they are uh, definitely going to try to help us with other allies to uh, be more successful on the battleground and also already thinking about rebuilding the Ukrainian economy when the war is over. I am. Uh, I must say that I am impressed by your your fair analysis. Uh, sometimes it's a bit difficult uh, to believe that you are Ukrainian, but uh, Prof, uh, I want to thank you very much uh, for your time this thank morning you, and to yeah. and to wish you well and uh, please keep safe uh, along with the family. Uh, we all pray that this will be over uh, as soon as possible so that life can begin to return to some sort of a normalcy. Vladimir Dubovic, Associate Professor at the Department of International Relations, Mechnikov National University, Odessa, but now speaking to us from Lviv. Thank you for your time this morning. Thank you, sir. Thank you for having me. Thank you. After the break, Russia is to supply Crimea with electricity from occupied power plant in Ukraine. Please join us again. Thanks for staying tuned. Welcome back. Britain's government says it is proposing a new law that will require social media companies to proactively tackle disinformation posted by foreign states such as Russia. The law would tackle fake accounts and platforms such as Meta's Facebook and Twitter that were set up on behalf of foreign states to influence elections or court proceedings. The law is likely to be passed during this parliamentary session through an amendment to link the National Security Bill and Online Safety Bill, both of which are in the government's current program. Communications regulator Ofcom will draw up codes of practice to help social media companies comply with the law and will have the power to issue fines for infringements. Digital Secretary Nadine Doris said on Monday that the invasion of Ukraine has shown how Russia uses social media to spread lies about its actions. That there is a continuing controversy over the issue of medical certificates uh, issued by universities in Ukraine uh, for uh, students who have either just completed their studies or are in the process of completing uh, their studies. We started a series of discussions on this matter yesterday with Dr. Moni Gasper uh, in the British capital, London. Uh, today, I'm happy uh, to be joined by David uh, Cushredo, who is a fifth year student, uh, medical student that is, and who was studying uh, in Russia, or uh, rather in Ukraine, and uh, managed to escape with his life, uh, and returned home uh, when the conflict started earlier this year. David has been on the show before. Good morning to you, David. Good morning, sir. And we've been tracking you. Uh, first, uh, there is something that I thought I should draw your attention to if you knew about it. Um, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs is asking, actually, I read an advertorial yesterday, that um, people in your shoes uh, should report to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs for your documentation to be taken down so that you can actually be placed in Nigerian universities uh, going forward, um, possibly getting help uh, in securing your transcripts to make that possible. I thought that was good news. Um, it's, uh, it is good news, but um, to be honest, that's like the first I'm hearing from you. Yeah, it's in, today, it's in yesterday's newspapers, okay. actually. Um, or like, or like my mom like sent me something that, oh, some people from foreign affairs said I should write like my name, my mm -hmm. university, mm -hmm. like just to give them my information. So I've done that, but like this you're telling me it's very, very good news, sir. Now at the end of it, my pro I'll, I'll get my producer to give you the document so that you can follow through with that. But let's come to, let's assume that uh, you, you weren't going to move to the Nigerian university because mm -hmm. the last time I spoke to you, you were actually concluding the year studies. Yes, sir online now here we are faced with another huddle which says that if you complete those studies and you don't go back to ukraine if you do the balance of the studies online and get your certificate 
it will not be recognized in Nigeria. You will not be able to use it to practice in Nigeria. Do you know this? I heard of that, yes, sir. And what has been the reaction of you and your colleagues? Well, let me talk on the side of those who are graduating this year because right. um, six years, some seven years because of the language, it's not easy. And you can't say that after all they've done, even though it was online, you can't say that after all they've done that you like disprove them because what do you want them to do? I have, like they're my seniors, I have some of them, they are like in their late twenties that, okay, medicine was what they wanted to do. They tried other courses, but they were like, oh no, they want to do medicine. And after going through it, the money, the effort, the sleepless night, and now it's like, oh, it's not going to be recognized. So what do you want them to fall back to? And these are the type of things that make people enter depression. And so it's not something nice to hear. Even as I'm not yet done with medical school, I'm going to my fifth year. And even I'm now like rethinking at all. Oh, if I'm not able to work in my country, if I can't come back to my country, then what's the point? Because the whole point is, okay, study abroad and okay, come and make an impact in my country. But if that's not possible, then what else am I meant to do, sir? Well, actually, I, I, I tried to get some of, I will come back to you to ask uh, about the reaction of some of your colleagues, if you've spoken to any of them. But I, two things, I, I, I know that um, I got a, a message from one of your, well, not exactly a colleague, a senior, uh, who is about finishing and who said that the National Assembly had, in fact, canceled that decision. And I had to, you know, get a reply across to say no. The National Assembly has not cancelled that decision. It cannot cancel that decision. It passed a resolution asking for the decision to be reversed. There are two separate things. The decision has not been reversed. Mm -hmm. But more important is, what are you guys thinking that you can do about it? Because there, I checked. As at the start of this conflict in late February, there were 4,300 Nigerian students in universities in Ukraine. It was about anything like 8% of the total number of foreign students in Ukraine. Yes, sir. And about 70 or 80% of you were in, medi uh, in the medical courses. So th there's a big number of you who are going to be affected by this decision. Yes, sir. What's been the reaction that you're getting? I mean, apart from you, I mean, what are others saying? Like, um, my friends don't just want to believe it because it's disheartening. Like, after all you've been doing that, oh, you can't come and walk in the place you were born or something like that. So, like, my friends, I would say, like, they've been calm about it, but I know, like, deep in, in their heart, it's not easy for everyone. They're obviously, like, not happy about the situation. So they are calm, but they are hoping that something is going to happen that is going to, like, work in their favor. The other thing about this is that already, even before this decision, those of you in the shoes of having left who had to leave, yes, sir. you were already facing hurdles, which you and I had spoken about before now, yes, sir. which is even in securing your transcripts to say, oh, okay, I want to move to another university where I can continue my studies physically. The universities in Ukraine where you were have put a couple of hurdles in your way to secure those transcripts, including, in some cases, having to physically return to Ukraine. Uh, so already there's a problem. With this now, do you think maybe returning to Ukraine, some may begin to consider that as a possibility? Um, I think, first of all, like um, some schools in Ukraine are starting, started making some headways, right? So um, I know of my friend in Ternopil, he was like, okay, the school said they can start either offline, but you can't travel to Ukraine, so you have to go through um, Moldova or Poland. So you have to get like a visa, a Polish visa. You have to tell the embassy the whole situation. And when you get to those countries, you have to go to Ukraine by land. It's a whole journey, but- What will you be going to Ukraine for? To go to school. Like they said, they're going to start offline. Really? Yeah, so they had like three options to do um, offline, online, and um, or like you get relocated to another university that they are trying to make like um, have like affiliation with some other schools in Great Britain to to like take some students. So okay. they had one of those three options to choose and they gave like a breakdown. If you're doing like 
offline, you need to come back to you. Ukraine. Course, naturally. Yeah, and if you're doing online, say they're going to provide, um, they're going to work with um, some um, medical um, organizations that help, like, make videos. Okay. So you have, like, free videos, and the, the teachers will help prevent, like, make clinic, clinic, sorry, help with clinical cases right. to help those type of things. So, like, some schools are making headway. My school hasn't really started anything. We keep asking, but like they don't really answer. So, so it's still can... all online in your case. Yes, yeah, so we're going to. Do, yeah, we're going to do online as at start of four. But if if you wanted to actually physically transfer to another university, I mean, I don't I, I don't see your mom, for example, allowing you or, or agreeing with you to return to Ukraine under any circumstances <laughs> yes. as things currently stand. Uh, so if you wanted to relocate or go to another university, you will need your transcript. Yes, sir. Now that process which you described to me a few weeks ago that, were, that was laid out for you to be able to secure this transcript, is it still that way? Yes, because they haven't like, because I said people keep asking in my school and they haven't like given any response. It's Which is this school? Like, I mean, for the record, just rem remind, remind everyone again about this school. Lviv National Medical University. Okay, because we were speaking to a prof just now uh, yeah. who is in Lviv, even though he doesn't lecture there, he's had to relocate there. He's in Odessa, or he's from Odessa, uh, you know. But so in that university, there's still no progress as to the issue of transcripts or securing it. No progress, sir. So if you wanted to go to a school in the UK or even in Hungary or Poland or Moldova physically, that is not relocating back to Ukraine, how would you do that if you don't have your transcripts? I said it's impossible, like, without the transcript. And I said my school has given us um, ways you can get it, which the ways are not um, palatable. You have to get expelled and you have to be physically present, which it's not possible. So. It's impossible to get any transfer to any school or anything like no that. No school will take you if you don't have a transcript. They will probably take you, but not from, like, if you're in your fifth year, you would start again from the beginning, so. Yeah, that's like starting afresh, like a new student. Yes, sir. That wouldn't be palatable either to most of you. Yes, sir. Virtually all of you. <laughs> yes, sir. So what exactly, what exactly are you guys thinking of doing now? Are you organizing yourselves, for example, to make a case? Because you're Nigerians. I know I've read about... Uh, students in your situation in several other countries who have tried to organize to get their governments to intervene. Perhaps that's what has led the Ministry of Foreign Affairs to do what they're now doing. Yes, but that's going to take some time. In, you know, but in the meantime, what are you guys doing? To be honest, nothing. If I'm being honest with you. Like, we've not... Because everybody's mind is not, like, in the right state of mind because of the whole situation. So we've not, like, come together to discuss all say we want to do anything at this point we are just hoping okay for the final year students they release their certificate and for us that our transcripts are released or we have the opportunity to go back offline but like in terms of coming together to do anything it's no that's not what we're thinking about so there's so many other things that it's on our minds so. you mentioned earlier on that many of you are kind of like depressed because you've gone through a lot already in the last four or five months First, you had to live in a hurry, many of you, without any of your belongings. Yes, sir. And then you had to go through this harrowing journey through uh, places where, at best, we would say they were dangerous. In many instances, they were more than dangerous. And then you had to find your way in foreign countries all the way back home. In your case, some other people are still in those other places they had to run to. Uh, and then now you're faced with all these hurdles. Not difficult to imagine why you would be upset or why you would be uh, depressed, as you pointed out. But going forward now, because you do want to continue. Yes, sir. So w what are the options that you think would be viable for you? I mean, the whole issue of the recognition of the certificate for someone like you is still a year or two down the line. It's not immediate. Yes, sir. But there are a few people who are supposed to graduate this year. Yes, sir. Uh -huh. So they, for them, they, they are in a different situation. But for you... What are you looking at? So if I continue with Lviv, um, it's probably going to be online. So um, I would need to get that experience, like go to the hospital. And what uh, I feel is like we have to have like um, maybe an, uh, in Nigeria, maybe they could help like the foreign students 
get to like those hospitals, have like hospitals take us in to make us like get like acclimatized to the hospital environment because yeah and, and get practical experience because one of the reasons the regulator gave is that uh, medicine is not what something you can completely learn online and that you need to be in the hospital you need to yes, relate with people if you're going to be a doctor yes sir that makes sense but it's not your fault that you're not able to do that right now yes, sir. so in this situation you've just mentioned now being absorbed into uh, uh, the, the system one way or the other, but supposing you could get your transcripts and you could be placed in a Nigerian university to complete your studies, is that the kind of thing that you or those like you who you talk to would consider? Is it a viable option? For me, it's not out of the option. If um, a Nigerian university wants to absorb me, it's not out of the option, but we have to look at the fact that um, in Nigeria, what university is going to absorb us and constraining the whole let's think of like if the federal university or state, state university because there's always strike all the time and majority of us that go um abroad like the timeline is six years you're doing your six years no here you do six years you don't know probably when you're going well, to finish. actually universities the federal universities are on strike as you and i sit here and are speaking and they have been for most of this year anyway yes sir so that's that and that was the reason why many of you went outside in the first place not so viable what does that leave us with? <laughs> to, to be honest, it, I'm scratching my head because <laughs> I know you're probably scratching yours. What does that leave that? So I, as I said, I don't know. So what I feel we can do or what I can do is if the whole situation doesn't end, continue to do the online and not necessarily like getting into other universities, but like at least um, hospitals or like organizations can come together to help us. Okay, you're done with your um, school come and do the practice or when you are you have like this period to do like your practice to get like the experience or something like that as we can't do medicine online trial you can have the practical knowledge i won't like to use that i have the knowledge in the world but if they said oh come and do this i'm like okay i would need like assistance but absolutely those are those are some of the difficulties here okay finally before I, before i let you go I, I i must then ask this because i've asked some of your colleagues uh, off of the program and they said well we're intending to come back here and practice anyway <laughs> because it's not exactly as if the doctors here are in very good stead so if they don't recognize our certificates it's their loss um do you have that feeling yes i no no not, i do want to come back and practice in nigeria at some point but the they are making it difficult and it's not supposed to be I feel that, okay, some people study in Nigeria, all good and fine, with a study abroad that want to come back. It's a new perspective, like, because you can't just have the, you know, in Nigeria, yes, they could teach you some new things, but people come in, they could help those in Nigeria, and those in Nigeria could help those that are abroad. So, yes, I've, I've had that opportunity, that, okay, if Nigeria does not want to accept myself, that other, other countries would, but... It's my country, and I do have to help my country, and I hope that like, in the future that it's been able to be like resolved, and those, this type of things will happen, sir. David Koshodo, uh, I can only wish you the best. Thank you, sir. Uh, I will keep up with you and continue to track you. Uh, I, I hope uh, when uh, you get the results from the uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs uh, advert, uh, we'll bring you back to come and give us the update and yes, find out how, how that works out. But for this morning, thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you for being with us. Let's have other stories, but coming up later, we'll have all the unpacking of the business news. And there are people still dancing in Ukraine despite all the despair. Please stay on with us. Thanks for staying tuned. Welcome back. Let's talk to Laddie Williams. Let's unpack some of the business stories. Exactly. Uh, <laughs> the euro is crashing. Yeah. Yes. Uh, that's not good news, is it? Not good news. More woes for the eurozone. Why is that? At this point. And 
At the end of the day, we've seen uh, the dollar actually strengthen, you know, get to new highs. And uh, looking at that dollar index, you know, that's tracked, you know, against about five other currencies, we've seen how much, you know, the dollar has strengthened. At the end of the day, there's a relationship between interest rates and uh, currency strength. We've seen, you know, the U.S. raise rates and we've seen the dollar actually strengthen because of that. But the Eurozone, they've not really raised rates as high. They're still about uh, close to zero percent, you know, when it comes to interest. So investors uh, do not like that. And we've seen them, you know, moving out. And the major issue is Russia. Russia, again, again you know, uh, shorting uh, gas, you know, from Europe. Investors have weighed that and they see that if the, with the reliance, you know, Germany and Europe have on Russian gas, a shutdown of gas would impact them enormously. You know, at this point, we've seen how that will impact their industries. And, you know, analysts have said this will wipe out a huge chunk, you know, from their, uh, from German revenue. And obviously that will also lead to, you know, unemployment because they will have to lay off workers and passing on the cost of rising uh, energy costs to the consumers is another strain on the economy. And we've seen how the German government are trying hard to see how they can buffer, you know, all of that. So at the end of the day, we're seeing uh, the, the, the euro uh, weaken uh, to the dollar. And analysts are seeing this might actually, there might be parity at some point. We've not seen that in 20 years. A, a, a while back, you, you could buy, you know, a dollar for a dollar twenty-two cents, you know, against the euro. But now right. we're seeing it about a dollar four cent, and if it gets to a dollar, parity, a dollar a euro, that would be incredible times. And you know, investors, you know, are not uh, finding it funny at this point, and we're seeing them move away, you know, to the, the stronger green back at this point. As if that is not enough. Right. Norwegian oil workers have chosen this moment. To go on strike. Yes, yes, it's the it's the same problem. Rising global inflation, but your salaries remain the same. And right. they say, you know what? We want our salaries raised at this point. That's what the uh, gas workers are saying at this point. That we see, and obviously economists say that when inflation is high, you don't really want to raise wages because that will also stoke inflation. Inflation, yes. But at the same time, the workers are saying, you know what? Our purchasing power is being eroded here. We need more money. We need our wages hiked. If not, if you're not going to do it, then we're going to down tools. And that we're expecting for that, that to cutting, happen. For that cutting flows. supply. Exactly. Yeah. And because Norway is a huge producer. You know, uh, producer of oil. And that will also raise uh, 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 oil prices. We've already seen you know, prices rise this morning. And... Uh, Obviously, if that continues, if this strike actually goes on, about 25% will be wiped off global supply at this point. <laughs> now, uh, with all of this, I mean, uh, back here in this region, uh, we already had our difficulties long before all of this came up. Right. And uh, I know that earlier on, uh, the Ghanaians were considering a bailout, but they said they wouldn't go to the IMF. Exactly. But they're going now. They, they have to go now because at the end of the day, with all these rate hikes, you know, globally, we're seeing that impacting borrowing costs. And obviously, low-income countries are going to be hit the most. And we've seen how much inflation, you know, has risen in Ghana, even right here in Nigeria. In Nigeria so yes. at the end of the day, uh, these, these countries are hit by uh, food insecurity issues because of this war in Ukraine. Rising energy costs is the same culprit. It's this same war that's causing all of this. It, these things were already happening before the war, but obviously the war has stoked, you know, that even more. And we see, and we know Ghana is, you know, the, the darling of investors. And, <laughs> which, is, which is why this would be extremely surprising. Exactly. You know, th these investors have overlooked their debt uh, level. It's about 80% uh, to, uh, to their GDP. When investors don't mind. They're like, okay. There's a lot going on in this country. We've seen a, a couple of these countries go and cite their, you know, companies in Ghana. So at the end of the day, we're, we're, these countries are trying not to amass so much debt at this point. But at the end of the with, with all of this going on with the headwinds, these countries will still have to borrow to get out of the mess out of the situation there. And hope that and things get much better much for them better. to be able to pay back. And we're seeing the protests happening in Ghana at this moment. So there's, there's a lot for Ghana to contend with, you know, at Indeed, this point. There's, there's quite a lot for them to, uh, right. to contend with. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Ladi, uh, as always.
the question which is hanging in the air is will Nigeria follow Ghana yeah. to the IMF? Well, uh, analysts are saying we might actually tow that path at this point because uh, things are not really changing. And after the elections, we know elections cost money. And uh, after the elections, sure. the, the, the chicken will come home to home roost. To roost. So Indeed. <laughs> Indeed. Thank you so much, Laddie. Me. Lots to unpack. There will be more of that on other business uh, uh, programs right after this show and then later on on Business Incorporated. Before we go, let's take a look at some of the sports news. Uh, British tennis authorities have reportedly received fines of about one million pounds by the Women's Tennis Association over the decision to stop Russian and Belarusian players from Wimbledon. The punishments come after the Lund Tennis Association and the All England Lund Tennis Club are opted to exclude Russian and Belarusian players from participating in events in Birmingham, Eastburn and Nottingham that took place before Wimbledon. The LTA runs the tournaments in Eastburn and Nottingham, while the AELTC holds the license for the event in Birmingham. Outlets uh, from Russia and Belarus have been able to participate on the ATP Tour and WTA Tour as neutrals, which is supported by the ITF. And Ukraine skeleton racer Vladislav Herasovich has called for Russian athletes to be banned from all sports, insisting it was absolutely crazy that they play while we suffer. Herasovich made global headlines during this year's Winter Olympics in Beijing when he displayed a banner saying, no war in Ukraine after completing his third run of the women's skeleton event. His demonstration came amidst fears that Russia was looking to invade Ukraine, a move Moscow denied at the time. Eroskovich claimed that a junior Russian bobsley athlete messaged him saying that the wanted a bomb dropped on my house. And finally, in that constant threat of shelling and bombing, Donetsk residents have found ways to enjoy life. One example can be seen in the city's central park where dozens of people could be seen dancing in a space called the cage. One resident, Anatoly, yeah, said he had visited this outdoor it. dance floor since he settled in Donetsk in 1990, then a city in the Soviet Union, adding that the shelling, which has become a daily occurrence in the town now, would not keep him away from his favorite pastime. Others were even more philosophical about it. Sergei, another resident, seemed to have reconciled himself with the dangers of living in the city, saying, if it is not our destiny, then we won't die. Well, for most, dancing simply gives local people something else to think about as the daily threat of shelling falling on the city continues. Another way of looking at life. Thanks for being with us. That's our program this morning. There'll be an update uh, during the world today at 5. Later on, the show is back at 9 a.m. tomorrow. My name is Ladi Akiri Dulwali. Do have yourselves a good Tuesday ahead. Good morning.